Hi there, in this video I'm going to be summarising what we actually go about doing in the event that we have a violation of one or more of the Gauss-Markov conditions. So the first Gauss-Markov condition which we're going to be talking about is that of no perfect collinearity amongst regressors. So let's just remind ourselves of what exactly this means. The idea is that you have some sort of model y is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 and some other regressors and finally you have your sort of error term. And the idea in if we had actually perfectly collinear, collinear regressors x1 and x2 would be that I could sort of write out a linear equation which connected x1 with x2. So x1 might be equal to delta naught plus delta 1 times x2. So why does this hinder our ability to use least squares in this situation? Well, the idea is that if I know x1, I know x2 perfectly. So in a sense, it's not, not going to be possible to unpick the effect of x1 or x2 individual effect on y. So that's why I can't get a read on beta 1 and beta 2 at the same time. In, in, in this sort of case here where we have a sort of relationship between two of our regressors x1 and x2. So what actually happens if you try and estimate something where, whereby there is an exact linear relationship between two, two or more of the variables? In most sort of statistical programs you get out some error which is something like you've got a sort of singular matrix. Uh, I think that's the exact uh, error which you get out if you're sort of using e-views. Other statistical programs vary slightly, but again, it, it usually involves the word singular because the idea here is that in the matrix form of econometrics, you can form a matrix of your independent variables. And in order to get the individual estimates of beta one, beta two, all the way through to beta p, um, exactly or to get a unique value of those parameters, the matrix itself has to be invertible. In other words, it has to be non-singular. Don't worry if you don't understand what that means. I'm just sort of providing some context for why it says singular matrix. So how do we handle this example of when we have the violation of no perfect collinearity and we have some sort of perfectly collinear, collinear regressors? Well, the idea is that essentially you just omit one of the variables from your regression. So here we might omit x2. So because there are no other variables which are collinear with x1 or collinear with any other variables or any of the linear combinations of variables, then I can just estimate this equation via OLS. There's no problem with doing that now. And similarly, there's no, nothing special about x2. I, I could just include um, I could get rid of x1 rather than x2 in my progression. And again, I would be able to estimate this via a less. So as it kind of stands here, it seems like quite a simple problem to have, that of um, having no perfect collinearity amongst your regressors. So why am I sort of making a big deal about it? Well, it actually becomes a little bit more difficult to see when, because this would also be an example of perfectly collinear regressors. So if I had delta 1 x1 plus delta 2 x2 is equal to, let's say, delta 3 x3 plus delta 4 x4, that would also be an example of having perfectly collinear, collinear regressors, but it's just a slightly more complicated one. This sort of perfect collinearity comes about quite a lot when you are dealing with dummy variables. And when you have this sort of collinearity occurring, it actually becomes quite difficult to diagnose what is exactly causing the perfect collinearity to occur. Because a lot of statistical software programs don't actually have methods for identifying what is causing the perfect collinearity. So you actually have to go back and think from sort of first principles what each of the variables mean and whether linear combinations of the variables are equal to a linear combination of the other variables. So that's in itself a little bit more complicated to do. Okay, so that's the sort of problem if we have a violation of the assumption of no perfect collinearity. Now we're gonna talk about if we have a violation of the homoscholastic errors. Okay, so we've spoken about a number of tests for this particular 
Gauss Markov condition. We've spoken about the Broish Pagan test, we've spoken about the White test, the Goldfeld Quant test, all as a means for diagnosing whether we have heteroscedasticity. And if we do have heteroscedastic errors, we know that two things are true. Firstly, we know that OLS is no longer blue. In particular, out of the sort of B, L and U, we know that it's actually the B that's affected. There are other linear unbiased estimators which are better than OLS if I have heteroscedastic errors. So if I have a violation of the assumption of homoscedastic errors. So that's, that's one problem. Another one is that the standard errors which are reported in sort of software programs are generally no longer valid because the default errors which are reported in software programs assume that you have homoscedastic errors. So both of these particular problems can be dealt with with particular techniques which I'm going to talk about in other videos but I want to mention something else about the presence of heteroscedastic errors. Namely, if I estimate a model, I could have heteroscedasticity for one of two reasons. It could be that I have a sort of true heteroscedasticity in that there is heteroscedastic errors in the population, or it could be that I'm emitting an important variable from my regression that might be causing this heteroscedasticity, or it might be actually that I've got some sort of functional misspecification, which is kind of like an emitted variable problem. And those are much more serious problems than these two problems which I've stated down here because if I've got a, an important emitted variable, then essentially that means that I am going to have endogenous regressors. So OLS is not just, not just going to be no longer blue, it's no longer going to be unbiased. So I'm going to have a violation of this sort of U in the blue here. So in that sort of circumstance, we might like to think about either including those important emitted variables or we might have to think about using some other technique to deal with that endogeneity. But I just wanted to mention that in actually having homoscedastic error or heteroscedastic errors in our model doesn't necessarily mean that we actually have heteroscedastic errors in the population. It is often symptomatic of the fact that we haven't specified our model particularly well. The third sort of gas Markov condition which we're going to talk about here is that of no serial correlation amongst errors. So by having no serial correlation amongst errors, we know that OLS is blue. And actually, if we do have a violation of this particular condition, the reason I've sort of lumped two and three together is that the if I have a violation of three, then I get exactly this these two problems here as we sort of have with homoscedastic, uh, the violation of homoscedastic errors. So the idea is that, again, we can diagnose um, whether our model has serial correlation using either sort of the Durbin-Watson test or the, um, we talked about the LN test, which is sometimes called the um, broich godfrey test. And if we do have serially correlated errors, we know that OLS is no longer blue. There are other better linear unbiased estimators than OLS. And also the standard errors which are reported as default are no longer valid. So that's a particular problem which comes about as a result of having um, serial, serially correlated errors. Um, and again, serially correlated errors can be indicative of the fact that we have a sort of omitted variable problem in our regression as well. So that's something else to bear in mind. And again, we're going to talk about in future videos how we deal with the problem of serial correlation in terms of how do we correct for these sort of two problems down here which we talked about. Okay, the final thing which we're going to talk about here, the final gas Markov assumption which I want to mention is probably the most serious one. And that is the assumption that we have zero conditional mean of errors. So this is sometimes called, um, well, if it's violated, it's sometimes called the issue of endogenous regressors. So, and this is a really, really serious a violation of the gauss markov conditions because if it is violated OLS is no longer blue in particular it is no longer unbiased so that means that if I took repeated samples from my population and I used OLS on each of those samples then on average OLS would not get it right it would not estimate the population parameters 
uh, correctly. So that's why it's a particularly important violation of the Gauss-Markov conditions. Unlike the sort of middle two assumptions which we talked about here, there is no sort of simple test for endogenous regressors. Um, there are some tests, but they are, to be honest, beyond the scope of this course, so I'm not going to mention them. So normally the way in which we sort of assume that we have endogenous regressors is either through some sort of thought experiment, um, in which case we sort of think that there might be some other important emitted variable which we would like to include in our model, um, or it's just the fact that we have got a model which isn't particularly, it isn't working particularly well. So again, I suppose that is in itself suggesting that there is some other important factor which we should be including or some sort of functional change we need to make to our model. But just because there isn't a test for this particular Gauss-Markov assumption doesn't mean that we can't think about a remedy to it. And fortunately, there is a potential remedy to it, which we're going to talk about in this course, and that is the use of instrumental variables. And we're going to talk about that in future videos. But just to say here that essentially we find some third variable z, which is correlated both with our endogenous variable, let's say x1, and our, independent, our dependent variable y, but is not correlated with our error u. If we can find a variable which satisfies these sort of three criteria, then it turns out that we can form a consistent estimator of beta 1 in our sort of regression model. So that's at least a step towards what we had if um, we actually had non-endogenous regressors. In the next video, we're going to talk about the homoscedasticity assumption, and in particular, how it's symptomatic of emitted variable bias. I'll see you then.